There we go. All right. Perfect. Now I can see too. So uh, this is the second talk. Um, all right. So it's going to be radiation biology and physics, kind of the why and how of radiation. And again, uh, feel free to stop me and ask questions at any point. Um, this is being recorded, so any really stupid questions, I'll play it. No, I'm just kidding. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, stop, stop me if you have questions, um, or you can write them down, we can, you can ask them after. Um, so the goals are to understand how different forms of radiation interact with tissue to treat cancer, uh, understand some just really basic principles about fractionation, um, you know, treating with multiple fractions over a long course, uh, understand how radiation is produced for external beam treatments, so photons, electrons, and protons, um, understand how radiation dose is measured. Uh, and then discuss basic treatment planning principles. Um, so let's start with uh, how does uh, radiation interact with tissue to treat cancer. Um, so the first thing to think about is whether a type of radiation is uh, directly or indirectly ionizing, and then whether it uh, direct, has direct or indirect action. Um, so on the left here you can see an, a photon coming in, so this would be photon treatment and uh, photons have no charge, so they can't directly ionize. So they have to hit an electron, which will then go floating around an ionizing uh, molecule, which will then damage DNA. Um, direct action is the photon hits an electron, which direct, then directly damages DNA. Uh, indirect action would be the photon hits an electron, that ionizes water, and you get a hydroxyl radical, a hydroxyl radical then floats around, hits the DNA, and damages the DNA strand. Um, any ideas which indirect or direct uh, action is more common? Indirect, yeah. So indirect is actually much more common. Um, I want to say two-thirds to one-third, but I think it's actually higher than that. Uh, so uh, just kind of to... <clears throat> reiterate the point, so directly ionizing, so things that, for something to be ionizing, it uh, has to have a charge. So, uh, Kieran, would a photon be directly or indirectly ionizing? Indirectly. Indirectly. Uh, uh, Matt, what about electrons and protons? They should be directly. They're yeah, able to. yeah they, they can be directly ionizing. Um, Jeff, what about neutrons? Indirectly. Indirectly. Um, so, photons and neutrons no charge, indirectly ionizing. Um, and then uh, heavy ion, which is charged, would be directly ionizing. You can also have indirect ionization. Uh, and then what about direct action? They all should. So they, they all could have direct action. Um, all right. Uh, So DNA damage and repair, uh, single strand breaks are generally not lethal. One gray of radiation, which is one joule per kilogram of energy deposited by the radiation, a gray is one joule per kilogram, causes about a thousand single strand breaks, but these aren't lethal. The cell is very good at repairing them. Um, and you probably remember from first, second year of med school, there's basic excision repair, nucleotide excision repair, misrat, mit, mismatch repair, these all repair single strand breaks or errors. Um, Double strand breaks, however, uh, are what cause lethal damage, and uh, cells will undergo mitotic catastrophe or apoptosis. Um, these are two different types of cell death. Uh, and one gray of radiation or cause about a thousand single strand breaks, causes on average about 40 double strand breaks. Um, and these are repaired through two mechanisms. You can either have non-homologous end joining, uh, which is the same mechanism that B cells and T cells use to create their um, variable regions or you can have homologous recombination, which is a mechanism that the cell uses to ensure that when it's replicating its DNA that it maintains fidelity. Um, and uh, non-homologous end joining uh, is basically sticking the two ends together and it's very error prone. So you've damaged, you break the DNA, you've damaged it, and this repair pathway comes along, it just fixes up the ends enough that it can glue them back together. Uh, homologous recombination is not error prone, it uses the template strand from uh, the uh, sister chromatid and can uh, repair the DNA with um, no loss of uh, information. Um, 
So non-homologous end joining dominates in, if you remember the cell cycle, you have G1, S, where you synthesize a full copy of DNA, and then G2, and then mitosis, or M phase. So non-homologous end joining is used primarily in G1 and early S, when you don't have a second copy of DNA. Homologous combination is in late S and G2. Um, so which cell phase do you think would be most or, or yeah, most resistant to radiation. Yeah, it's late S, early G2. Um, when, it start, when you start getting a late G2 and you're getting near mitosis and the cell's getting ready to divide, if you damage the DNA, it causes a double strand break, it's already kind of committed to dividing and it'll die. Uh, early S or G1, if you damage the DNA, it causes severe, cause a break, it can't repair properly, and eventually when it tries to divide or or reproduce, it's going to have some error. Um, so when it can do a good homologous combination repair is when it's going to be most resistant. Make sense so far? Okay. Uh, so radiation interactions with tissue. Um, we talked about this a little bit. The primary effects are mediated by DNA damage. Um, it does have some effects on cell membranes, but that's really... Um, I guess a lower dose has some effects, but really at high doses when we start to think that there's some significant contribution. At the doses that we use in clinic, it's mostly the, the tissue damage mostly mediated by DNA damage. Um, yeah, and like I say here, very high dose radiation can affect cell membrane integrity, protein structures. Um, this might be important for SBRT or SRS, but it's really outside the dose range used for fractionated radiation. Um, so when photons interact with tissue, there's four primary mechanisms, actually not just with tissue, with any matter. There's four mechanisms that the photons can uh, interact by. The first one's called coherent scatter. And this is the photon goes past an, an atom or a nucleus, takes a slight turn in direction, but doesn't lose any energy. Um, the interesting thing about coherent scattering is this is the reason the sky is blue. Um, I'll see if I can explain this in two sentences. Uh, Kieran's heard this before, but um, it's actually a little bit different than what I told you I found out later. But, uh, it's inversely proportional to the fourth power to the wavelength of a photon. So blue has a much shorter wavelength than red photon or light. So red photons are much less likely to undergo coherent scatter. So when you look up at the sky away from the sun, the blue photons are much more likely to just change direction as they pass an atom. So that's why you see blue. The red photons just keep going past. So, uh, But this has nothing to do with what we do in clinic. Photoelectric effect, uh, this is where the photon hits an electron and kicks the electron out of the orbit of the nucleus. Um, and then electrons surrounding the nucleus fall into the hole that's created by that electron that's been kicked out and they release characteristic x-rays or, or gamma rays that are actually the, the, those would be x-rays um, oh, that, one. that would uh, that are based on the energy difference between the different orbital levels of the electrons and it's probably bringing back painful memories of like first year college chemistry or something but, um, this is very important for diagnostic imaging not as important for therapy although it relates to why we now do KV imaging instead of mega voltage imaging um, the photoelectric effect is dependent on uh, it's Z cubed over E cubed. So the more protons, which is Z, the number of protons in an atom, uh, is to the cube power proportional to how likely the photoelectric effect is. And it's 1 over E cubed. So the higher the energy to the third power is inversely proportional to the likelihood of photoelectric effect. So bone has a high Z. So, uh, Jeff, would it be more or less likely than a low Z material to have photoelectric effect. A low Z would be less likely. Yeah, so bone has a high Z, so it would be more likely, right? So when you take a diagnostic x-ray, you're using x-rays in the range of, say, 100 K keV, kiloelectron volts. Those are very likely to undergo photoelectric effect in bone, but not as likely in soft tissue, and so you get nice contrast between bone and soft tissue. As the energy goes up, you get into Compton interactions. And Compton interactions are really what dominate what we do in radiation oncology, or why, why treatment works. And this is where the photon knocks an electron out of the 
orbit around the atom. The electron goes screaming away and hits other electrons and causes free radicals to form hydroxyl radicals or damages the DNA directly. Um, and this is really what causes DNA damage. Um, now, Compton interaction is proportional to... The likelihood of having the uh, Compton interaction is proportional to 1 over E. It's not dependent on... Uh, sorry, 1 over E and the electron density. So it's not proportional to uh, the Z of a material. So if you've seen an MV film, I don't know if you guys have seen port films taken with mega voltage imaging where we just turn the Linac on for a second and take an X-ray. It's very hard to see soft tissue compared to bone. Um, uh, let's see. We'll talk about this more in a second. And then you have pair production, which is where the photon spontaneously um, creates an electron and a positron, which then can cause other reactions. Um, so here's a uh, kind of diagram of the four interactions. So you can see in the upper left, this is a uh, coherent scatter. The photon comes in, goes past the nucleus, go comes out with the same energy. Here's a photoelectric effect or uh, interaction. So the photon comes in kicks out an electron that's called the photoelectron and then you have characteristic x-rays that depend their energy depends on where the electrons what orbital they're in and what which ones fall into that hole um, Compton interaction you have a photon come in uh, it hits an electron the electron scatters out at a certain energy but the photon actually can continue on also at, a, at less of an energy and that's based on how directly it hits the electron um, and then lastly, pair production, where uh, the photon comes in, it has to be greater than 1.02 MeV, mega electron volts. Um, the mass energy of an electron is 0.51 MeV. Same thing for a positron. So essentially you're taking the energy of the photon, converting it into mass of a positron and electron. And uh, any leftover energy from the photon gets converted into kinetic energy for the electron and positron. So this is kind of a representation of, depending on the energy of the photon that comes in, how likely it is to undergo either photoelectric, Compton, or pair production. So photoelectric uh, is mo very likely at 25 keV kilo electron volts, which is, we're talking about diagnostic X-ray range. Uh, the photoelectric effect and Compton interactions are approximately equal likelihood. Compton then dominates all the way up to 25 MeV. Photoelectric is zilch at this point, and pair production starting at 1.02 MeV starts to increase, and above 25 MeV, um, it dominates. Uh, and again, photoelectric is dependent on Z cubed over E cubed. Compton is proportional, inverse proportional to E, so higher energy, less likely to have Compton, um, and the electron density. Uh, and then uh, pair production is proportional to Z times E. Um, you need to double check this. Compton may be proportional to E, not 1 over E. Anyway, um, so this is showing, depending on the energy of a photon, what the attenuation will be based of water versus lead. So lead has a very high Z. So you can see the attenuation is much higher here than compared to water, which has a low Z. And we're talking about, this would be about 100 keV, down here would be 25 keV. So what interaction is dominating here, Matt? Low, low energy. Photoelectric. Yeah, and that's dependent on Z cubed, right? So Z, high Z in lead, a lot more protons in a lead nucleus than in a um, water nucleus. Uh, you get much more attenuation. When we start moving into 1 MeV range, they're pretty much equivalent. And Kieran, what effects can be dominating here? Compton. Compton. And that's dependent just on electron, electron density, which is about equivalent, yeah. uh, unless you have a high hydrogen, a material containing lots of hydrogens, and you have one proton, one electron. Otherwise, it's pretty much two, uh, an electron per neutron and proton, so it's basically equivalent. So you can see the attenuation here between lead and water is about the same. 
So you can imagine if this was calcium in water or calcium in muscle, it's going to look like this. That's why MV x-rays are very, uh, MV images are very hard to see any contrast between bone and, and muscle. And most of it comes from some low energy x-rays that are being attenuated. And then up here you have uh, lead starts to attenuate more. Um, Jeff, what's dominating up at these energies? The pair production. Pair production. Uh, and again, that's now dependent on Z, but less so. It's Z, not Z cubed, mm -hmm. right? So lead's going to attenuate more than water, though. So that's interesting that the attenuation of both lead and water is almost equal for a short period of time. Yeah, yeah, so this is... One to... Yeah, so lead. this is where the Compton effect's dominating. Mm -hmm. um, and Compton is just dependent on the energy of the photon and the electron density. And the electron density of lead and water are about equivalent. Water is actually slightly higher, and I'm guessing that's because it has some hydrogen in it. So, as, as, so what happens when the photons hit tissue, though? Okay, so now we're talking mostly about Compton effect. Um, this is what we call a depth dose curve. So you have depth on the x-axis, usually in centimeters, and you have uh, dose on the y-axis, and usually is uh, from 100% would be here. So when the photon beam, which is coming in from the left side, hits the tissue, or we can do this in what's called a water phantom, uh, which is basically a fish tank that the physicists use, and they can measure with um, uh, meter. They can measure the dose at different depths. Very shallow, a very shallow depth. You're going to have a low dose. A kerma is called kinetic energy released per mass, or mass air. So the kerma is the highest right when the photon beam hits the tissue surface, but dose is dependent on the energy being deposited by those electrons that are screaming around. So an electron that gets knocked out here might float down here before it deposits its dose. So dose doesn't peak until the maximum energy electrons have reached their maximum depth. So the higher energy beam, photon beam you have coming in, the deeper your maximum depth uh, point will be. Um, for a 6 MV beam, 6 megavoltage beam, it's about 1.5 centimeters. For an 18 MV beam, which is what we use in clinic 6 and 18, it's somewhere around 3 centimeters. Um, and so this is what's called, this is why you get the skin sparing effect you might have heard people talk about. Um, and so this shows you different energy beams. These are all photon beams. This is a very low energy beam. Uh, this would be called... Uh, I'm not sure if it be ortho voltage or super voltage. Um, but then you can see as the beams get higher in energy, so 10 MV. Um, the maximum depth moves deeper. And then you have 25 MV, it's even deeper. Uh, and you get more skin sparing the higher. So this is the skin sparing effect. You get more skin sparing the higher the... Uh, um, beam energy. Okay. Uh, electrons are a little different. When electrons interact with tissue, they're directly ionizing. And starting at a... They tend to have a, a much sharper falloff uh, than the um, photons. And you get kind of this plateau region here, and then they fall off pretty rapidly. Um, and these, interestingly, they can interact with tissue, and they also, you have some interactions up in the head of the machine through bremsstrahlung, which is breaking rate. Talk about that more when we talk about how photons are generated. So you actually get this, you get this tail of dose down at the bottom, and that's some photons that are generated by the electron beam, and they go deeper than the electrons. Um, electrons are a little bit different. They don't um, have skin sparing, or much less skin sparing. Uh, also, the higher energy an electron beam gets, the less skin sparing you get. Or the, the, the higher an electron energy beam is, the more surface dose you get. So it's the reverse of the photon beam. Electrons still, the maximum dose still gets deeper with higher energy, but the surface dose goes up with higher energy. So, in electrons, we use different energies. We use 6, 9, 12. 16 MeV, um, and uh, those are, um, we can even combine them. You can use a combination of 6 and 9 to kind of optimize the depth that you want to treat On the same machine. 
Yeah, so you could use two, uh, you could treat the same field with a 6 MeV beam and then with a 9 MeV beam and you could weight them equally, you could weight one a little more than the other to get the depth dose characteristics you want of, of either beam. All right, so what are the basic principles of fractionations? We're going to move away for, from physics for a minute to talk about radiobiology. Um, so radiation therapy has traditionally been fractionated over a treatment course and spread over several weeks. And this takes advantage of differential repair, repair abilities between the normal and malignant tissues. So this is a um, survival curve. So the higher the dose of radiation given to, uh, it could either be cells in culture or it could be a tumor potentially, um, the lower the surviving fraction. This is log scale here on the y-axis. So if, let's say I give two gray, either in a split dose or in a single dose, you can have the same surviving fraction, right? Now if I give the same dose in a split dose, the cells kind of start over. And you get, you have this region up here of the curve, it's called the shoulder. And that shoulder repeats itself. So you get a higher surviving fraction than if you gave the same dose in a single fraction. And that probably has to do with the number of double strand breaks that occur and how the cell is able to repair itself. And there's some other stuff we'll talk about in a second. But this is essentially right here, if you understand what's going on, this is the principle of fractionation. You can imagine, I think I have a figure later, if we spread this out over 60 fractions, the difference between giving 60 gray versus 62 gray fractions, it's going to amplify and you would end up with a much higher surviving fraction at the end. So uh, Rigaud in France, this was in the early 1900s, did a pretty famous experiment that um, found that a single dose of radiation uh, was sufficient to sterilize a ram, um, but cause skin toxicity. So I think they would give like six gray in a single dose, and it would cause skin toxicity in the scrotum of the ram, but also sterilize the ram. They found that if they split it up into several fractions, they could cause no skin toxicity, but still sterilize the ram. And so it's got to do with differential repair of the uh, spermatogonia versus the skin. Um, so this is kind of the first famous demonstration of fractionate, the effect of fractionation. Yeah. Uh, and this is probably, probably one of the most famous images in radiation oncology from a radiobiology book by Hall. Uh, and so in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, Rigaud and Coutard showed extended treatment time for uterine cancer can improve outcomes. You can fractionate for head and neck cancer, reduce toxicity. But this is back when we had low energy photon beams and, and skin toxicity. Remember those depth dose curves, you're using low energy, the maximum dose was going to the skin. And you had lower energy, you had more photoelectric effects, you had more deposition of bones, so you get really bad bone toxicity. But one of the limiting factors was skin toxicity. They'd treat until you got a certain level of moist desquamation for like breast cancer, head and neck, and then they'd say, that's it, you're done. We can't give you any more. Don't know what happened to the tumor, but you're done because of your skin. Um, so if you could fractionate and spare the skin, you could give more treatment. Fractionation works to this linear quadratic concept, and I've been saying this for three years now, and I'm taking my boards, and I still feel like I'm kind of understanding it, so don't worry if you don't understand it when I try to explain it here. Uh, so you have a linear portion of that survival curve where one electron may cause two breaks, uh, which then rejoin and cause a, a chromosome or chromatid aberration that causes a mitotic catastrophe. The chance of this is one-to-one. -one. But you have a squared component where you have the chance of two different electrons or, or ions coming in and causing two independent breaks. And so this becomes more likely as you go to a higher dose. So at low doses, this linear portion dominates the survival. At high doses, the quadratic portion dominates survival. Another way to think about it is these are single hit kills versus double hit kills. So the more photons I deposit, the more likely I'm going to have a double hit kill, the more likely this quadratic portion is going to take over. Don't worry if you don't understand this. But. So different cell lines have different dependencies on the linear versus the quadratic component. And this would be a low, we talk about alpha, beta. Alpha is the linear component, beta is the quadratic component. And you can give the ratio for different tissues or different tumors, or different cell lines. So a low alpha beta is going to be dominated by uh, the beta or the quadratic component, but up here you're going to have less cell killing, versus a high alpha beta is more dominated by the alpha component, the single hit, and you get more of a linear line. So if we fractionate, 
we can take advantage of um, this differential. And tumors are generally thought to be early responding or high alpha beta, whereas tissues like spinal cord or late responding tissues are thought to have a low alpha beta. So if you remember that curve I showed you where you fractionate um, like this, you can see D1, D2, D3. If we fractionate the low alpha beta, the late responding tissues, the survival curve is going to be more shallow than the high alpha beta, it's, and you're going to have a steeper curve. So that's the differential effect you get when you fractionate. But you can kill the tumor, spare some of the late tissue. Um, if we change the fraction size, you can adjust the biologically effective dose. Um, you can ad take advantage of the alpha beta ratio for different tissues. Prostate cancer now is thought to maybe have a lower alpha beta ratio than most tumors, so we're starting to hypofractionate that. Um, there's an equation you can use to calculate the different biologic effective dose. It depends on the alpha beta of the tissue or the tumor. Generally, 3 is used for late responding tissues like spinal cord. 10 is used for early responding or for tumors. Um, I don't want to go through this in too much detail, but if you calculate 72 gray and 1.8 gray fractions, it's 40 fractions. Um, so this could be, for example, like a prostate treatment or head and neck treatment. Um, if you have an alpha beta of 3 late responding, it's 115 gray. But this is based on this alpha beta of 3. If you look at an alpha beta of 10, it's 85 gray. Um, but if I were to adjust the fraction size, they don't adjust equally because the alpha beta is different. So I don't want to spend too much time on it. There's an alpha beta concept. Linear quadratic, I think that's enough. You've heard it. And we can adjust the biologically effective dose. So what factors affect tissue response? The four R's. This kind of classic radiobiology. Repopulation, so accelerated growth, how quickly the cells grow between fractions. Reoxygenation, so you need oxygen to fix the radical damage, and so you have both acute and chronic hypoxia, we'll talk about this, uh, repair, so sublethal damage repair. You damage the DNA, the cell's trying to repair it, how good is it repairing it before you give that next fraction of radiation. And then reassortment, so what phase is the cell in when you hit it? Is it in that early S that's radiosensitive, or is it in that late S, early G1, where it's radioresistant? And both malignant and normal tissues are affected by these. So repopulation, cells repopulate between each fraction. Um, and you have differential repopulation between different tissues, and that affects your survival curve. So this is an example. If you give one dose of radiation and then give a second dose, this is the amount of time between that second dose. If you give the second dose really early, you get a low surviving fraction. If you wait, and just look at this blue line here, after a certain period of time, you get no difference. So this is... Down here you're looking at repair, but now here you start to get proliferation, and so when you give that second dose after, say, 24 hours, you've had some proliferation, you're going to kill less cells. Um, and we'll talk more about this curve in a second, but does that kind of make sense as far as repopulation? Can you say that one more time? Sorry. So, initially the cells haven't started to grow, mm -hmm. but if you wait too long, the cells will grow and divide. Now you've got more cells by the time you give your second dose of radiation. So you're going to have a higher surviving fraction than if you gave it, say, it's six hours after the first yes. dose. Don't worry about this stuff here. I'll, I'll talk about that again. In that break in the x-axis there, is that... I'm just saying longer time. Right, So, yeah. but that's not an established amount of time. It's different between, tumor yeah, tumor or cell tissue. Um, so this is why you'll hear people say, if we wait, if you extend your treatment time, we need to give more dose or you lose a, your uh, cure potential. And that's because there's repopulation. So all the fractionation schemes that we gave are based on you know, lots of uh, trials and treatment methods. So if you take a 60-day treatment regimen and suddenly extend it to 70 days because your patient had toxicity and needed a break or decided to go on vacation to the Bahamas for a week, you've had some repopulation in between, and now you've lost some of the effect. Giving radiation... Uh, in fractionated doses allows reoxygenation both from the acute hypoxia but also you get some cell killing. Some of the hypoxic regions may, because of pressure um, from the tissue or edema, may get more blood flow and they become better oxygenated. Um, 
we talk about an oxygen enhancement ratio. So X-rays, which require the ions to go out, break the DNA, and then that needs with hydroxyl radicals, and that needs to get fixed by oxygen. Um, we talk about an oxygen enhancement ratio. If, if you have a well oxygenated tissue, or any actually almost any oxygen around, this is your survivor survival curve. If you have a hypoxic tissue, this is your survival curve. So this is about a two and a half fold difference in survival. Um, and there's some data from cervical cancer and head and neck cancer where patients who have low hemoglobin counts or anemic may have worse local control. There's some debates about whether this is true or not, but uh, there is data out there. Um, high linear, linear energy transfer radiation. I don't want to get into this too much, but neutrons, alpha particles, heavy ions like iron or carbon aren't affected by this, and this is because they cause severe damage to the DNA as they're flying through and releasing their energy, and it doesn't require oxygen to kind of make the damage permanent. Um, but x-rays, photons, electrons, they all have this oxygen uh, dependence. And the interesting thing is it's very little amount of oxygen that's required. This is 3 millimeters of mercury partial pressure, or about 0.5% oxygen. Um, gets you about half of your radi uh, sensitization. And if you go up to about 20 or 30, which is venous blood, you're already at 100%. So venous blood even has plenty. So they've tried giving patients like uh, hyper treatment or having them breathe 100% oxygen and really hasn't shown any benefit. It's probably because if you have blood, you have enough oxygen going to the tissue. So if it's, um, there, there's some stuff, there's this thing called carbogen. They're trying different things with nicotinamide to relax blood vessels. Hyperthermia may open up blood vessels, allow better oxygenation. Um, but the actual amount of oxygen required is very low to have this effect. Um, repair, so different tissues might use different repair mechanisms. Depending on the point in the cell cycle, they may be more uh, able to repair damage. And then repair deficient cells are very sensitive. So ataxia to angiectasia, which is um, a mutation in this ATM gene required for DNA damage uh, sensing and repair. Patients with this disease are very sensitive to radiation, like three times as sensitive. Um, it's kind of a contraindication radiation treatment. Luckily, it's very rare, but... Um, and then also, differential repair affects that alpha-beta ratio. Um, something that's not able to repair very well is probably going to be more dependent on that single hit versus something that's able to repair very well is going to be more dependent on that double hit. Uh, and then reassortment. So depending on where the cell is in the cell cycle, it's going to be more sensitive or less sensitive to radiation. So cells will kind of accumulate. You'll kill a bunch of cells that are in the uh, early S, late G1, you know, the radiosensitive or in the mitotic phase. Cells that were sitting or kind of in the late S, G phase are going to be more resistant. and They'll start cycling around. So what you're seeing here, if you remember this graph, surviving fraction, time between doses, if you give the dose just the right time, the cells have reassorted. They've gotten into that radiosensitive late G1, early S phase. You hit them with the second dose, and your surviving fraction drops down, Okay, compared to cells that weren't cycling at all. So that's that fourth R, reassortment. Now, unfortunately, we don't know what the cell cycle time is for different tissues and different tumors. I mean, experimentally, you can figure it out, but it's not really practical to say, well, we think this is, you know, to try to customize it for individual patients or individual tumors. There's some different fractionation schemes out there that try to take advantage of this. And Actually, if you talk to Dr. Haraf about the WO-WO treatments and the chemo that they give, the hydroxyurea probably helps to get synchronized cells in a certain cell cycle times, and then they come down for radiation, and it's supposed to be that they're, they've kind of been blocked at a certain point, now they're going to be in the S phase, and you hit them with the radiation. All right, how is radiation produced um, for external beam treatments? So photons, electrons, and protons. Um, so photons, you can get x-rays, which come from uh, man-made sources, or you can get gamma rays, which are from natural sources. So cobalt, iridium, iodine, radium, all natural sources. Linear accelerators produce x-rays, but they can have the same energy. So this is a natural source. You have radium. It's emitting alpha particles, gamma rays, and beta particles. Um, do you know what betas are? Or, I'm sorry, uh, uh, helium. Uh, that's alpha. Yeah, alpha is helium. Uh, beta is electrons. You have beta minus electron, beta plus is positron. Um, 
<coughs> gamma ray. So now, why are these curved? Any ideas? The beta and alpha? They're charged. They're charged. So, but what's going on that they're curving here? There must be a magnetic field, right? Gamma ray, no curve, right? So non-charged. So there's a magnetic field here, but they're not affected by magnetic fields. Um, so this is a natural source from decay. Uh, this is how man-made photons are produced. You have Bremsstrahlung, or what's called breaking radiation. If you accelerate electrons to really high speed, as they pass by a nucleus and they bend uh, the nuclear in their direction, you get a photon produced. Um, and this is uh, proportional to the energy of the electron and how much it bends. Um, but uh, that photon is what we produce in a linear accelerator. It's what's produced in diagnostic X-ray tubes. So a uh, a cathode ray tube, TVs also used, old cathode ray TVs used to work this way. Um, this is a diagram of a linear accelerator, the same way that a TV worked. You had electrons that would come off the cathode ray tube, they'd accelerate and hit the TV screen, and there were phosphors on the TV screen that would then, um, when the electron hit them, uh, it would produce visible light. That's uh, why you don't sit too close to the TV. Yeah, although the, the uh, energies that are being produced by that aren't yeah. enough to ionize. So like cell phone radiation is not ionizing radiation, so it really can't cause DNA damage that people are worried about. So I'm not too worried talking on my phone. Um, now linear accelerators, you just have a much more powerful accelerator to accelerate the electrons to very high energies um, in, up in the mega electron volt range. So when they hit that target, when they hit, it's usually tungsten, I'll show you a diagram later, um, they produce high energy photons. Uh, rather than low energy photons. Um, I don't want to get into too much about this, but you have a, a microwave source that creates high energy microwaves that feed into this accelerator tube. You have an electron gun that feeds low energy electrons in. They get accelerated to high energies by these microwaves. Um, you have an electron beam that then gets bent around in our linear accelerators by a bending magnet. Now, if you had a photon being created up here, would you be able to bend it by a magnet? No, right, because it's uncharged. But the electrons are charged. You can bend them with a magnet. And then you have a target in the treatment head that will create the photon. Um, and I have a diagram of that. Uh, electrons are produced by beta decay, although we really don't use that clinically. Some uh, isotopes we inject, radioisotopes, use electrons, um, or they're beta decay. Uh, but um, for a linear accelerator, it's produced... Like for external beam treatments, there's no isotope we can use for electrons. You have to use uh, an accelerator too. Um, and the only difference between electron beams from a photon beam is we take that target out of the electron's path, so you don't get any Bremsstrahlung radiation. You just let the beam out of the patient, and we put a scattering foil in to spread out this little beam of electron. So this is a linear accelerator. This is a varian accelerator, just like what we have in our treatment room. You can see the accelerator tubes up in the kind of neck of the accelerator. You have a bending magnet up here that spins the electron beam around, so it's coming down towards the patient. And then in the treatment head, these are diagrams. I know it's a little hard to see. Uh, this is X-ray mode or photon mode. So the electron beam comes down. It's going to hit a target, usually tungsten. You get Bremsstrahlung radiation. So now this is all photons. Your electrons have been eaten up by this target. They go through a primary collimator, or there's a big... These beams, uh, these uh, photons can be scattered in other directions. So you have a big seal up here, a big uh, collimator blocking photons from going anywhere else. They come down, so they're, they're directed this way. Now your energies are going to be higher right in the middle of the side, so they pass through what's called a flattening filter. You can see it's thicker in the middle than on the side, so that flattens your beam out. They go through an ion chamber that measures how much dose is being delivered. So when we talk about monitor units, that's what's measuring your monitor units. This is your monitor chamber. They go through a secondary collimator. This is your jaws of the machine. You have X and Y jaws. It basically makes a square or a rectangle. And then they'll pass through a tertiary collimator, which would be um, like MLCs, the microleaf collimators. And then they hit the patient and you have a flat x-ray beam because of this flattening filter. Electron beams, you take the x-ray target out, take your flattening filter out, and you put a scattering foil in. So your beam hits this foil, scatters out, you still have your ion chamber to measure how much dose is being delivered. 
you still have your jaws, and then you use a cone because electrons kind of scatter all around. They're not as focused as photons. You have to use a cone to kind of bring the electrons down to the patient. They're not scattering out of the field. So if you've ever seen electron treatment, um, you'll see that there's this attachment from the treatment head that goes almost all the way down to the patient's body, and that's blocking these scattered photons from hitting the patient. Can I ask a question? So yeah. You said you're able to modulate the energy of the electron beam, mm -hmm. and I assume that's just how fast you accelerate the electron. But what kind of s makes it so you cannot modulate the photon beam on a You can. So the photon beam, when we say, I'm going to use a 6 MV photon beam, uh -huh. what you're using is a 6 MeV electron beam that's hitting the target. Okay. And the interesting thing is a 6 MV photon beam, the average energy of the photons is actually only about a third of your maximum energy. So a 6 MV photon beam has an actual energy equivalence of about 2 MeV. Because you get a, a kind of bell-shaped, not a bell-shaped curve, a curve that's shifted to the left. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have photons from 0 all the way up to 6 MeV that come out of that target. The majority will be around 2 MeV, but they'll peak up at 6 MeV. So MV is not a single energy. But when we talk about electron beams, we call them MEV because they are a single monoenergetic beam. So you can have a 6 MeV beam, a 9 MeV beam, 12 MeV beam, 16 MeV beam. You can have 14. I mean, we just, you commission different energy beams, though. The physicists know exactly what the dose is at different depth. And um, so we usually use a low energy and a high energy beam. So every machine in a clinic should have a low energy and a high energy setting. So some of our machines are 6 and 18 MV. I think the two on the farther end, and then the two closer ones are 6 and 15 MV. Um, usually that's enough to do all the treatment plans, take advantage of the high energy or low energy beams. Um, if you want to add a third energy, you could, but then the physicists have to go through a lot of work to commission it and check that it's working properly. So usually you'll have one of each. Um, but it's kind of arbitrary in a sense, what you choose. So the number defines the energy of the electron beam hitting the target, not the actual energy of the photons. The photons are a, a smear of different energies. Electrons, monoenergetic. So that's kind of something to remember. Yeah. Uh, protons, so protons are a very high mass compared to electrons. So they require a cyclotron to accelerate to the velocity with energy um, that are within that's within the clinical treatment range. First cyclotron was developed by Ernst Lawrence at UC Berkeley. Oh, I didn't even do this on purpose, but I wore my Caltech today. Um, and these are huge devices. These are like city block size devices. This is a diagram um, of a proton facility. You have a cyclotron here. Uh, the protons are brought down this uh, tube. You have magnets that are bending them. And then these are the gantries to treat the patients. So each one of these is a, a room. This is a uh, used to treat like um, uh, ocular tumors. So the patient will lay here. You have the beam coming right out. These are rotational gantries. These things are, so this is the cyclotron. You can see about how big it is. Um, so reasonably, that could fit in a room. Um, but the gantries are enormous. And I, I think I have a picture later. If not, they're about three stories high. Now all the patients use when they go in the room is this snout from the gantry that rotates around them, and the room looks like any of our vaults. But what they don't realize is there's a three-story gantry rotating around them. So that's why these uh, facilities cost upwards of like $130, $150 million to build. Protons are useful, though, because of this Bragg peak. We talked about this a little last week. Um, but as a proton comes in, it goes along, doesn't deposit much energy, much energy and then right at the end of its um, uh, track, it has a peak of energy deposition. And so if you s combine a whole bunch of en different energy protons, you can get a spread out Bragg peak, but you have no dose beyond the end of your, your uh, treatment field. Um, this is a modulator, uh, I think it's called a modulator wheel, I forget exactly, but you can see it's different thicknesses, and the beam is coming through here, and that's spinning I think around 500 times per second, second or minute. Um, and so you get different energy protons, and that's what produces your spread out bright peak. And you can use different types of wheels and then other compensators in the beam to affect the depth of your spread out bright peak and the total depth, treatment depth. 
Um, there's two kinds. You can use a scanning pencil beam uh, where it actually treats individual voxels. And these are kind of starting to come into practice, but the more common kinds are scattering proton beams where you essentially kind of like the electron foil scatter, you uh, target to scatter the protons out. There's other treatment modalities, neutrons. You have to bombard a target with protons to create the neutrons. Um, they can't be accelerated because they have no charge, so they're somewhat difficult to make. And then heavy particles, helium and carbon. Uh, and use a cyclotron similar to protons, but they're even bigger facilities. And no U.S. centers currently are using these for treatment. Um, there's a couple centers in Japan, and I think one in Europe, and that's really it. Um, but they have a brag, brag peak similar to protons, and it's actually even sharper. Um, so uh, they're using it for that. The other interesting thing is they produce some um, radioactive carbon or iron when they uh, deposit, and they release a positron like PET. And it's, I think it lasts for about 15 or 20 minutes. So you can actually take the patient off the table, put them in a PET scanner, and image where you treated. Um, kind of cool. All right, how do we re uh, measure radiation dose? Um, so uh, to determine the biologic effect, we need to know the number of ionizations produced by a beam. Um, so absorbed dose is measured in gray or rad, uh, essentially energy per mass deposited. Uh, equivalent dose is measured in sievert or rem, and this is based on the type of um, treatment beam that you're using. Uh, and so neutrons or alpha particles will have different equivalent doses um, than photons or protons. Uh, there's different dose measurement devices, uh, ionization chambers, we have a little air cavity, um, thermoluminescent dosimeters, where you, uh, this is what we use on patients, we put a TLD on their skin, measure the amount of dose they're getting, make sure they're getting what we th the computer thinks they're getting. Solid state detectors, is like a little diode, um, and you can use film, or you can use calorimetry, where you measure the uh, amount of heat uh, produced by radiation beam, but it's... Uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's such a small fraction of a degree that it's almost impossible to measure this in at least the dose of radiation we're talking about. Um, the most common ones we use ionization chambers that physicists use for their quality assurance checks. TLDs we use a lot for patient checks. It's very easy. You can reuse them. Um, solid state detectors, these are used for like the IMRT quality assurance. They have a whole bunch of diodes in that array I showed you last week. Um, film uh, we'll also use pretty regularly. Calorimetry is really not used. So that was kind of a brief overview of dose measurement. All right, basic treatment planning principles. Did you uh, say which method those little things you guys were used? Just out of curiosity. Um, so those are, uh, uh, they were TLDs, but now they're uh, optical measure. It's similar to a TLD where the dose deposited. TLD, what happens is you heat it up, and it releases some light, and you can measure the amount of light release. That depends on how much radiation dose it gets. Um, I think it is a TLD in the in the badge. Um, but there's something different. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember off the top of my head. There's something different between the badge one and the ring one. Um, one's like a chemical reaction. Uh, but, yeah, same, same idea. Um, so treatment planning... It, Basically, treatment planning depends on these depth dose curves. And we have, so when I say that we have to commission a beam, um, the physicists know exactly what the profile is of every beam that we use for treatment. They put that into the treatment planning system, and it uses that to determine how many beams and what beam angles and, and what the combination of all your beams is going to add up to. So if the physicists don't commission the beam properly, every patient can get treated incorrectly. Um, physicists like to joke that radiation oncologists can kill one patient, physicists can kill or hurt all the patients. <laughs> um, so they take their job very seriously, it's very important how good the physicist is in your department. Um, but assen essentially, treatment planning depends on different energy beams and what the dose is going to be at different depths. And this is a cross-section of the beams. Uh, this is a low energy 200 kVp. So when you, when you look at an x-ray, it'll say what the KVP was, that's the kilovolt potential. It's kind of the same thing as when we talk about an MV beam. So this is the maximum electron energy, is 200 KeV. So the kilovolt potential was 200. Um, just another terminology. So this is a low energy beam. You can see it spreads out wide. It's kind of forward pointing. 
Uh, this is a cobalt beam. It's about equivalent, a little bit lower energy than a 6 MV photon beam. You can see you get a pretty sharp edge on the side, pretty flat, and uh, the doses are going deeper. Uh, this is 4 MV photons, so it's about equivalent to a cobalt beam. And then this is a 10 MV, so higher energy. So you can see your higher dose is deeper. And then these are isodose lines, so highest dose, and then it gets lower. So the higher the energy gets, the deeper your maximum dose gets, and then the deeper all the relative doses get. And these are all defined for different distances. This is skin to surface distance, so sorry, source to surface distance. So how far is the source, the target, from the, the skin? Um, it's usually 100 centimeters, although what we do is called SAD, source to axis, because we have an isocenter, and that's also usually 100 centimeters. I won't get into that too much. But then it's defined for a certain size because the size of the field affects the dose. This is if you took kind of a cross section through the beam. And again, you can see you get 100% of your dose in the middle. You get pretty much 100% of your dose or close to it at the edge. But then I've talked about this with some of you. Uh, if this is the block border of your beam, um, Matt, we talked about this yesterday. Do you remember what isodose line is always at the border of your beam? 50%. Um, so that's why. You put a PTV on your target, and then even after you put a PTV, the dosimetrist will add an extra centimeter to the block edge because it takes some about a centimeter for the dose to build up to what you're hoping it's building up to. Um, or when we draw out blocks, we don't draw the blocks right next to our target. We have to put some extra space. Um, electron beams, you have the same thing. You have different energy electron beams. It's kind of a confusing graph, but you can see higher energy electron beams get deeper dose, but you also get higher skin dose. So dosimetry used to do hand calculations. They would use graph paper. They'd take like outlines of patients, draw the beams on, and they could graph out. Um, I'll show you an example of that. And computer planning really revolutionized how I think we plan radiation. Uh, in modern treatment systems, you CT data uh, for 3D computer uh, 3D conformal radiation treatment, and then you can even use them to determine your optimum dose delivery for within each beam. You can op, uh, optimize the fluence pattern of radiation delivery. That's what IMRT is. Um, so this is kind of old school treatment planning example. You have a beam from the right, a beam from the left. Left, the cumulative dose will overlap. You get 100% of your dose right in the middle. Uh, but your max dose is actually right at the max dose depth for your your beam energy. And it's impossible to change that if you have two opposed beams. So you can see for a um, 4 MV beam, about a 6 MV beam, it's about a centimeter, 1.2 centimeters deep for max dose to get 100%. As I raise the beam energy, my max dose goes down and moves deeper all the way up to 25 MV, you can see the max dose is really almost equivalent to your target dose. But what's the disadvantage here? Uh, Kieran, what's what's the disadvantage to this? It's kind of a tough question, but what am I losing by raising the beam energy? So is this the surface or is this the deep part of the... Oh, uh, you're going to be losing goes to the deep part, uh, To the surface. When you, when so you this is it? one surface oh, and yeah, another okay. surface. Okay, yeah, yeah. So you lose some surface dose. Okay. So like in breast cancer, when you have a really large patient, oh, yeah. if we use a high energy beam to make a more homogeneous dose in the middle, we might spare some of the breast tissue on the surface. If we use a low energy <coughs> beam, it gets too hot on the surface. So what we end up doing is we combine the beam energies to try to take advantage of both. Um, this is another example. If you kind of took a cross section through this, you can see 129% of your dose here, 100% uh, of your dose here, back up to 129. So this is a beam coming in from here and a beam coming in from the bottom. And this will make more sense too when we do this planning session in a couple weeks. Um, you'll see, you actually do it and you'll kind of see what happens if you have one beam versus two beams and change the beam energy. Um, and then plan evaluation is very important. Uh, so we'll kind of go through some examples. We went through these last week, but we'll look at them again. You might make more sense. You've probably gotten some exposure in the clinic now. Um, so we'll look at early breast, 
prostate, external beam, and brachy, GBM, and palliative bone. So early breast, uh, we have two beams, tangents. One's coming in uh, medial tangent, one's coming in from the lateral. You can kind of see the border of the beam here, posterior border of the beam. So the reds are 100% isodose line. This is our lumpectomy cavity. So the purple is a little bit hotter. Um, and I apologize, you can't see it, but um, so the, the red is, I believe, 50.4 gray. And then the blue is 105% of your maximum dose. The purple is 110% of your maximum dose. Um, you can look at it on sagittal and coronal views. Uh, usually axial probably makes most sense, but it depends on what you're treating. And then we can look at a DVH. So the DVH, remember, is the dose on the bottom versus the volume of the structure that you're looking at or the, the contour. So we have a PTV and a GTV. Actually, the GTV, the red, is the lumpectomy cavity. So, um, Jeff, what what's the what percent of the lumpectomy cavity is getting 100% of our prescribed dose. I assume it's 50 gray, based on the DVH. Yeah, it looks like 100%. Yeah, 199%, right? Uh, Matt, what about um, for our PTV, which is essentially the normal breast tissue? It's not contoured on there, but... what it's getting 50 gray? It's getting 50 gray. It looks like 95%. Yeah, about 95%, which is also really good coverage. Now, what about normal structures? If we look at the left lung... Kieran, what percent of the left lung is getting 20 gray? It's hard to see. It's the yellow line. Uh, like, like 9%, 8%. Yeah, 8%. Uh, Jeff, what percent of the right lung is getting 5 gray? Or 500 centigrade? Hardly any. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. zero. zero. Right? Yeah. And that makes sense. I mean, you have these tangents that are totally blocking your right lungs way over here. And you do get a little bit of low dose. This is from scatter. Yeah. Okay. It's impossible to avoid, you know, gray. Um, treating pregnant women with breast cancer, we're not concerned about the beams hitting the, the fetus. We're concerned about the internal scatter from the patient scattering down. It's, there's nothing you can do. You can't block that. Uh, here's a prone breast treatment. So, um, Matt, what percent of our PTV is getting the prescription dose of 50 gray? Approximately. Is the PTV green? Yeah, okay. PTV is green. So there's no lumpectomy cavity. Huh? 50 gray, uh, about a little bit more than 90%. Yeah, 94, 95%. Um, now you can see less lung dose. Mm -hmm. So the left lung is the yellow. So the, the con color of the contour will always match the color of the isodose line. Mm -hmm. So yellow left lung, yellow isodose line. The heart's also getting a little bit lower dose. So that's the advantage of this prone treatment. The breast pulls away from the chest wall. You can spare some of the heart and lung. Um, here's a prostate cancer treatment. Uh, so <laughs> what critical structures do you think we'd worry about around the prostate, Karen? The bladder. Bladder. What's the other big one that we worry about? The rectum. Rectum. So our rectum, our dose constraint, we usually try to keep our V70 less than 20%. Um, so uh, Jeff, what's the V70 of the rectum, which is brown, um, for this plan? About... So, V70, 20 gray? Uh, it's the brown one. So, this is 10%. So, V70 is 70 gray, so we're going to be talking in percent. So, so, that's not D70? How do they... So, the V70 is the percent volume, volume receiving the so dose that you're talking about. So the oh, percent okay. volume so receiving V 70 gray. refers to... Okay, that's yeah, the V70, you could call it V70 gray. Okay. What volume is receiving 70 gray? Oh, I see. Yeah, so about 10%, 12%. Yeah, 12%. So is that acceptable? Is that within our dose constraint? Yeah, it's 20. Yeah. So Stan actually has other dose constraints that he tries to use, that he uses. Um, you know, he says you shouldn't just look at a single point, because what if it goes up like this? So he looks, um, one rule of thumb I've heard is that your VX should eat the volume, the dose you're uh, targeting, sorry, dose constraint plus the percentage should be less than 90. Uh, 
So like the V50 should be less than 40, the V60 should be less than 30. So V50 here is about 30%, so it works, right? Um, now, here we have two PTVs, uh, a PTV1 and PTV2. Um, Matt, any ideas? Are, have you worked with Stan? No. You've done some prostate care. Mm -hmm. Tough question, but any ideas why there's a PTV1 that's getting less dose than a PTV2? What's going on here? So what, what structure, what two structures kind of are like bunny ears behind the prostate that go into the prostate? You can just... Seminal vesicles. Seminal vesicles. And we worry about those having invasion by cancer, right? Mm -hmm. So this was an intermediate risk patient, presumably they had an endorectal MRI that didn't show prostate, uh, seminal vesicle invasion, but there's still a that they're, it's invading. So what structure do you think we treated to 50 gray, but not to 78 gray? Seminal vesicles. So our PTV1, the first PTV got about 50 gray. It still gets some dose from the rest of the treatment course, but you don't care as long as it gets your initial prescription dose. But then PTV2, which is just the prostate, it's getting 78 gray. When you do these uh, dose restrictions, is it based on, like, so when you just sort of Long, for example, is it based off just the contour of the lung? Yeah. And it's exactly up to the like. It's not lung plus plus margin, or is it? No, no margin. It's just just the structure itself. Yeah. Um, so you can also look at femoral heads, uh, penile bulb. Um, and so when they do IMRT, they'll set these constraints in advance. And then the computer will try to meet those constraints, but you tell it, and you can weight different constraints. So you could say, I want 100% weight, so I want, you absolutely have to meet the rectum constraint, but it's okay if the femoral head constraint goes over, so you might weight that 50 or 25. Um, you can also do that with the PTB. You could say, you have to get 95% to the PTB, you absolutely have to do that. So the computer will make sure that 100% of the good dose goes to 95% of the PTB. But maybe you'll give 100% a lower weight. So it tries to do it, but it's okay if it doesn't. So that's how MRT works. Kind of my hand wavy mm -hmm. version. So you preset all these constraints and hope that, sure. and you have to make it reasonable. If it's impossible, the computer won't be able to do it. But um, and the dosimetrists really good. They know what's feasible and what's not, and then they kind of start with a plan, and then they'll fine tune and tweak it. Um, so this is a brachytherapy plan. So uh, we look at a lot less structures on this, but you have um, your GTV, the prostate, you have the rectum, and then the urethra in the middle. Um, GBM, so what critical structures are we going to be worrying about in this patient? Brainstem. So brainstem, yeah. Uh, optic, optic nerves, optic tract, optic chiasm. Uh, so let's let's just do... Each do one. So for the optic chiasm, uh, what percent of the optic chiasm is getting them, say, 54 gray? Uh, Kieran, so the chiasm is the orange. Yeah. Uh, so it's right here? Right? I mean, yeah. So basically, no, not much yet. And so that's actually our dose constraint. So you don't want more than 54 grams. Uh, same thing for uh, the brain stem. Um, it's about 54 grams. So, uh, Jeff, you can see the brain stem here. So, is any brain stem getting more than 54 grams? So yeah, it looks like about. Yeah, so very. Yeah, very small amount. And we were willing to accept that. This isn't an all or none. So, if you go a little bit over. They're not guaranteed to get brain stem toxicity, but your wrist starts to go up. So we were willing to accept a small volume of brain stem going a little bit. Um, and then, uh, Matt, what about the left optic nerve? What percent is getting 54 gray? Which, so that's the blue. Zero. Yeah, and actually, what would you estimate the maximum dose is? The maximum dose to the left optic nerve, based on the graph. Um. About 47. Yeah, and it, it's actually right here. You could have cheated. 
Uh. Yeah, you're right. Forty six seventy six. So that's enough. Um, what about these, Karen? What's going on here? Oh wait, I asked you last time. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, what's going on with the green and the red lines? For PTV one, PTV two. Yeah, exactly. So you can see here, this is PTV two comes up higher. We do the T two flare volume for that, and that gets uh, 46 gray, and then the PTV2, the boost volume is based on the contrast and the surgical bed, and that gets an additional 14 gray to uh, 60 gray. You can see PTV2 starts to fall off after about 46, still gets some dose, um, and then it encompasses PTV, sorry, PTV1 gets some dose. PTV1 encompasses PTV2, so all that volume of PTV1 is going to get the prescription dose of PTV2. And then this is a bone net, um, so sacral mat's kind of hard to see, but uh, I think there's actually a sacral fracture. It's easier to see on this right here. Sorry, uh, iliac wing fracture. APPA plan, so if you look, this is kind of like that figure I showed you earlier with the beam coming from the top from the bottom. So you can see the hot spot is actually up near the surface here. And if we had more isodose lines, you'd see it's right at D max of our beam energy, which was probably 18 MV, because it's pretty wide separation. So it's not just theoretical. It's in effect. Make sense? And then on our blocks, uh, Matt, why is there a border? Why isn't it contoured right around the bone? Uh, is that because of yeah, exactly. Right. So the fifty percent isodose line is going to be right where I'm, where my block is. So if I'm trying to treat this iliac wing, I want a hundred percent or close to it to get to that. So there's a centimeter or so distance between that. So you don't just contour right on the bone. Um, how do we modulate uh, treatment depth uh, dose? So we can change the depth. We can add bolus or change the beam energy. Um, Sorry, you can add bolus to change the treatment depth artificially. Uh, you can add change the beam, en beam energy to get more penetration, change the number and intensity of beams, so that's like IMRT, you're using four fields instead of two. Uh, you can shape the beam with blocks, with multi-leaf collimators. You can use a wedge that'll just create an angle to the beam. Um, and you can change the dose per fraction, so you can hypofractionate or use SRS. Um, so this is kind of hard to see, but this is a chest wall plan treated this is a post mastectomy patient treated with bolus uh, and without bolus on this side. So if you look at your 100% isodose line, so the bolus is kind of invisible, but it's basically under this purple line. It's about a half centimeter thick. Your 100% isodose line is now almost right on the surface of the skin. But if you take the bolus away, you're now sparing about a half centimeter of skin before you get that 100% line. So that's, that's how bolus works, just adding some tissue to get rid of that skin sparing effect. Oh, so that's zoomed in. You can see the gap here where the computer can see the bolus and is planning and so it pulls your 100% line towards the surface. Without the bolus you, you miss some of the your target volume, the chest wall volume, that, that shaded blue turquoise region. Uh, you change the beam energy, so a higher energy. This is that graph I showed you. This maybe makes a little more sense after seeing that bone net. If I use a higher energy, it's going to lower the max dose and move the D max deeper versus a lower energy. You're going to have sharper fall offs. Your D max goes up if you're trying to treat to the same depth. You can adjust the number of beams, so more beams. Uh, you can use a block. Um, so these are lung blocks for a total body radiation patient. Um, this is an old prostate block, I think, from when they used to do 3D conformal or, uh, and this is before they had MLCs. We still use blocks though for electrons. We use them if you have a floating block, so a block that has radiation coming all around it, you can't use MLCs, right? The MLCs have to come in somehow. So you can make a block, a tray. And this is how we make them, and we have this section of room next door. Uh, you take an x-ray, you trace out what you want to treat, and there's a hot wire that cuts out a styrofoam mold. And then we pour in something called Cerebin that's basically equivalent to lead, except it melts at a very low temperature, hardens around it, and then you have your Cerebin block. So this is Cerebin here. 
And then you can melt it down and reuse it again. Uh, you can use multi-leaf collimators. So these are really supplanted blocks, except for those floating blocks, electron blocks, um, because those are much closer and they're much thinner. Uh, but it's up in the treatment head, and you should go in the treatment room sometime and look up into the treatment head, and uh, you can see the MLCs. Um, and uh, on our machines, uh, usually it's, I think, 10 one-centimeter MLCs, then 20 uh, half-centimeter MLCs, then another 20 half-centimeter MLCs, and another 10 one-centimeter, a total of 40 centimeters. Now, are the MLCs, uh, Jeff, in the treatment head, are the MLCs actually a centimeter thick? So do we have a total of 40 centimeters of MLCs sitting in the treatment head? No, uh, I think it's thick. This way, right? Like how, kind of. Well, so it's, so the width, the thickness, or the width of the MLC is actually defined by what it projects to, at the isocenter. So they're actually much narrower. Mm. So a one centimeter MLC is much thinner. It projects to one centimeter. Okay, so it gets bigger. So the MLCs are actually, I don't know, maybe fifteen by fifteen or twenty. We can go in, You can go in and look. And you'll see what I'm talking. Uh, you can use a wedge, so a wedge will change the angle of the isodose lines. Um, we don't combine those with IMRT, so you use the MLCs uh, for IMRT. You can use a wedge pair, so here you can see two beams coming in kind of at 90 degrees to each other. You get a hot spot near the surface because you have less uh, tissue attenuating versus deep. But if you put wedges in with the thicker area near that part of the beam near the surface, you can even out your dose throughout. Um, we were talking about doing this for the kid that we're treating with the neuroblastoma. I remember we were talking about doing a wedge mm -hmm. pair. Uh, and so we use a wedge. We use wedges for breast cancer treatment because as the breast slopes up, you have less tissue. So you put the heel of the wedge, the thicker part of the wedge, facing anteriorly so that the anterior part of the breast gets less radiation. Um, so you have the heel and the toe of a wedge. Um, and then uh, you can use multiple treatment beams. This is that GBM patient I showed you. Um, not only do we have beams coming in from around on a coplanar axis, but you had